This is Michael Matheson Miller, and you are listening to the Moral Imagination Podcast. My guest today is my good friend, Dr. Jay Richards. Jay is a research professor at the Catholic University of America's Bush School of Business. He's also the executive editor and co-founder of The Stream, which you can find at stream.org. He's a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute and the author of a number of books, including several New York Times bestsellers, including Infiltrated and Indivisible. Jay has a PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary and is also a documentary filmmaker. And I've learned a lot from Jay over the years in documentary and philosophy and theology, so I'm very happy to have Jay on the show. So today, we're going to be talking about his book, The Human Advantage. And the subtitle is The Future of Work in an Age of Smart Machines. Now, in this book, Jay discusses the rise of artificial intelligence and what he thinks the impact on the economy, culture, and human life may be. Now, this is actually part of a larger, longer interview. In part two, we're going to specifically deal with some of the underlying philosophical questions around artificial intelligence and technology, especially a critical look at philosophical materialism that underlies a lot of the current thinking on technology, AI, and influences the way we think about science and many issues around the question of what it means to be a human being, including areas of consciousness and embodiment. But here in part one, we're going to focus on his book, The Human Advantage. So I hope you enjoy the podcast. Let me know what you think and look forward to part two on philosophical materialism. Well, this book that we're going to talk about today is your, your newest book, um, The Human Advantage, um, which is about the future of American work in a high tech age and, and the, whole, mm-hmm. uh, the whole idea of, of are robots going to replace us? Um, and you you deal you deal with a lot of things. You deal with the new economy. You deal with ideas of creative destruction. Mm-hmm. Um, you deal with a lot of the f- the fears of of artificial intelligence and and robots. Uh, even even questions of like are all these jobs going to be lost and do we need a universal basic income? And at the core of it is really a certain view and philosophy of the person. So what I'd like to do is talk to you about your book, these kind of key ideas, and um, <clears throat> hopefully spend some time talking about some of the underlying ideas of the philosophy of the person. So why don't you maybe go give us a, a summary of your main argument and then wh- why, why you think it's important and why you wrote it. Well, I, I wrote it um, in, in large part to respond to a lot of the, I think, propagand- propagandistic claims that robots are going to replace us, that we're, you know, five to 30 years from creating technology, either robots or artificial intelligences that are going to completely replace human beings, uh, human activities, and human work. And so in, on the dystopian picture, that leaves us unemployed, and so the government needs to give everybody a, a basic income. On the utopian version of this story, we don't have to work because the robots are doing it all, and so we can just party all night uh, and sleep all day. I actually think both of those are dystopian visions, uh, and so I think um, I think it's false. I think if you just look at history and economics, there's no reason to think that technology is going to permanently displace human work, and it's certainly not going to displace human beings uh, per se. Uh, but also I think a lot of these predictions are simply based on, as you mentioned, really bad philosophy, just a really bad understanding of anthropology and of the nature of reality. And so they make these predictions as if they're based on knowledge of technology or economics or something, when in fact they're just an expression of an underlying materialist philosophy that's rarely articulated explicitly and I think rarely critiqued. And so I wanted not to write a high-level philosophical book that talked about that so much as a much more practical book about what's actually happening in the transformation to an information economy, um, how to understand it, what we ought to do about it, and how individuals ought to prepare for this age of smart machines. So that's that was really what I wanted to do. But as, as you detected, uh, as a discerning reader, there's an underlying philosophical case that I'm making throughout the book. Well, okay, so let's let's begin with the first, the kind of the first book. So the first part of the book, you you begin by saying, like, look, this technological shifts. This this is different than from what we've, than what we've had before. So um, mm-hmm. there's a kind of a tangent. I, I we'll talk about this. I I've, I enjoyed the book uh, for a lot of reasons, but one is um, there's kind of tensions throughout. So yes. at one point you say, you know, 
you're probably going to lose your job to machines. Uh, next point, you're like, but don't really worry about it because there'll be another job. And then the next point, you say, you know, it's it's really important that you're creative and you learn and you can go out and you can do things and learn things. It's a very inspiring chapter. And then the next chapter told me not to follow my passion. And I was pretty down about that because nobody really cares about what I want. Uh, and then <laughs> and it's this constant like tension. And so, so I liked that. I thought that the book was really good. And then there's also um, a, a mix of, serious, deep worry, uh, mm-hmm. and concerns and, uh, a level of optimism. Uh, and, and, and then as, you, as we talked about earlier, this philosoph- philosophical kind of underlying, um, uh, vision of the person, which I think is a, a robust concept of the person. So let's, let's, uh, let's maybe go through it. So the first, the first thing is, um, <clears throat> you talked about, um, how, well, the first thing I like to talk about, you you talk about how this shift, this technological shift in, in one sense, is nothing new. I mean, mm-hmm. we, we've, we've seen uh, development over time. Uh, and every time there's like an, ind- whether it's industrial revolution or whatever it might be, everybody's worried that the whole, you know, that, that the whole world is going to change and everybody would know there's going to be no jobs. And you call this, mm-hmm. I think it's the, the lump. What's what's it? The lump of labor, fallacy. lump of labor fallacy. And, I, and there's a, a story. I think this is right. That in 1891, I think this is correct. Uh, somebody said, you know, we need to close down the patent office because everything that could have been invented has been invented. Yeah, and there was a guy. Well, that's right. Sometimes misattributed to the the head of the patent office. It was actually another guy, but that's basically what he said. Everything that has been invented, can, you know, can has been invented. And there, this was just before the rise of quantum physics. Of course, predated the computer revolution by half a century. Um, and I think that it illustrates the point: is that uh, on the one hand, what's happening now is more or less what's happened several other times in the past. People could have made the same prediction about mass technological unemployment in 1776. You look around, if you were an American, and 95% of the population were living and working on farms, and they didn't have live alternatives. Most farmers uh, working on farms in 1776 didn't have several other skills they could have pivoted to if they'd lost their farms. You could have looked at a primitive steam engine and said, well, gosh, you know, this is going to get better and better, and at some point, People will be so productive that maybe one man can do the work of a of hundred men. And so maybe we'll get to a stage in which only 5% of the population needs to work on farms to feed everyone. And then most of the population will be out of work. Well, that would have followed based upon what was being observed upon the scene, the scene as in S-E-E-N, what could be seen. It would not have followed on what actually happened, which is that that disruption did occur over the course of a century or so. Right now, less than 2% of the population lives and works on farms. But of course, we didn't have permanent technological unemployment. People do other things, and in many cases, they do things that they'd probably even prefer to do, and, they, and they're even more productive doing it. That's the reality, and I think that's – I'd lay that out at the beginning. Don't panic. This has happened before. On the other hand, the moment in which we live is different from every other technological inflection point in its speed. That is, it's much – faster and much more disruptive. So whereas that shift just in the United States from the agrarian to the industrial economy, that took place over a century and a half or so. Um, Just in my lifetime, I grew up playing LPs on a record player that my parents had, uh, you know, started using eight track tape players and cassette tapes and CDs. And now I haven't bought a CD in six or seven years. That's just in my lifetime, just with one, uh, one medium, one thing that we're talking about, which is kind of transfer, a transfer of, of, uh, audio information. That's a a sort of a a way of focusing on this. Don't think that there's going to be technological unemployment where people are permanently put out of work. Focus instead on the rapid disruption and and the sort of space, the the pace of change and disruption. That's, I think, the real cost, the real worry, and the thing that we ought to focus on. Not this idea that everybody's going to be out of work for good or for ill. And you you address this, I mean, in a lot of ways, right? This, again, the farming example, but then even um, all of the jobs that exist today that didn't exist, say, when both of us were in college. Yes. You know, I talked to my children, like cell phones, like, oh, I didn't have a mobile phone in college, which, by the way, I think is better. Maybe we can talk mm-hmm. about that later. I, I think sure. like, it was kind of better that you you, you weren't in constant con- you know, contact with everybody. But that's, a, that's a, again, a, a question we can talk about on, on whether the technology is a problem or how we use the technology. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes people make that, that distinction. 
uh, yeah. or fa- make, fail to make that distinction. Um, uh, at the same time, technology does kind of shape you. But let's 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 deal. Let's address those questions a little bit later. What I'd like to, but the example you give, I think, is, I mean, think about all the people who are in computer software design, app design, all of these things. Even 15 years ago, most of these these jobs didn't exist. Sure. And so, what okay. I think you're, if what you're trying to say is that, um, yes, certain jobs will go away, but this technological development means new jobs will will come. And it's not simply um, a zero sum game where, you know, the economy is where it is. And once these jobs are filled, there's no more work for anybody. Is that, that's, yeah, what trying to get that's at. right. I mean, the lump of labor fallacy treats uh, labor and, and workers, in fact, basically as consumers. So you are not a producer or a value creator. You are a consumer of a job. And so if one, a job is basically a way of doing something at a particular moment. And so a job's going to be defined largely by what you can do, what needs to be done, what people want, and what kind of technology exists to do that kind of work. And so if you think of a job in that way, um, if that's all it is, then of course those jobs per se have been disappearing and appearing ever since human beings first chipped you know, a couple of flint rocks together and started a fire. When we become a little bit more productive, in principle, we're doing more than a person could do that didn't have that. But of course, we're not just consumers of jobs. We're also laborers and workers and creators of jobs and value. And so to say that, okay, these jobs go away, that doesn't follow that there's like only a fixed number of jobs. That's, that's just crazy. And we know that historically, that's the idea of a lump of labor fallacy. There's just this lump. There's this pile of labor, this amount of work that needs to be done. And so if I do some of it and somebody else does some of it, there's only so much of that work to go around. And then once it's taken up, you know, there's nothing else to be done. It's the same old zero sum game fallacy that we often encounter in trade or in thinking about wealth. But here it's actually applied to work, to the amount of work to be done. And I just think once you see that, you realize this is ridiculous. Yeah, we should worry about if I have a job that gets displaced, if I'm a long haul trucker, that's all I know how to do. And suddenly a Tesla truck does it better than I can. And I'm out of a job. That's a real cost that I think a real human cost we have to focus on, but we shouldn't mistake it for something else. We shouldn't mistake that disruption for a literal loss of either the net number of jobs or the amount of work in theory that there is to be done or the amount of value and wealth that there is to be created. It's a disruption. Treat that as a cost and figure out how to fix that. Don't, don't misdiagnose what's actually going on. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of things. So the one is um, just a quick story. My my mother and father. Um, my mother was a physician, and um, she went down in, after she retired with my father and worked at a hospital in um, in, in Ghana in West Africa. And uh, so she she actually bought, by the way, a lot of copies of Michael Novak's book, mm. uh, and she would give them away uh, to people. She liked the, <laughs> she liked Novak. And uh, but anyway, I know you, of course, were uh, good friends with Michael yeah, Novak. Spirit, yeah, spirit of democratic capitalism. Right, that's, that's the one. About. Yep, absolutely. Yep. yep. But anyway, and so I remember uh, she she um, she said we should get a lawnmower, and there were there were. Um, people who are cutting the grass and they said, well, no, no, we can't Dr. Miller because if you get a lawnmower, um, these people aren't going to have a job. And she looked around at the hospital. She said, no, look, look at all the work that needs to be done here. It was a very <laughs> poor place, right? Yeah. Uh, she said, look at all the work that needs to be done here. You know, trust us. We have, we have work for people, but the very, the interesting thing is, you know, this same mistake is made by PhDs. Yes. So like, why do you think people get that wrong? Well, it seems intuitive. I mean, the reality is it's the old, um, I think it was Frederick Bastiat that first came up with this idea of the problem of the seen and the unseen. What we see is before us, the actual jobs in factories, the actual taxi drivers and long haul truckers. Uh, th- we can see those being lost if they're being displaced by some other kind of thing. Whereas the new types of job, the new types of work, that the value that's created by the transition, it's almost always in the future. And so you, you end up having to sort of take, make this act of faith in which you say, okay, I'm, trust me, I'm, I'm telling you that the things you see, you're going to see the things that are lost and you're not yet going to see the things that are gained. And that's, it was the same case with, with your mother in Ghana. They could see the lawnmower jobs that would disappear. They didn't have any, they really had no way of knowing, okay, what other kinds of things could people do when they weren't already at present doing them. And so I think that's why I think you can, it's why you can get books from tech entrepreneurs like Martin Ford 
who wrote The Rise of the Robots, who make more or less the same argument, even though he should know better. It's really a failure of the imagination. But the truth of the matter is none of us can quite imagine what other people can do any more than I would have thought of social media manager 30 years ago. I would have had no idea what that job was. And yet um, at the stream, we employ people that do that, you know? So right. that's just that's sort of the nature of creativity and of freedom is that it's unpredictable. It's non-deterministic. And so um, that's why I think so much of this debate comes back down to, okay, what, what's your, what is your metaphysic? What's your view of the human person? And once you kind of set that, that's going to govern the ty- type of predictions and expectations you have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I want to, because I think, I do, as I've said, I want to go back to that. I think, which, what I think is the, the most important part of the book, but of course, this is what I'm interested in, is, mm-hmm. uh, is this idea of the philosophy of the person and, and the problems that materialism do go. So, but before that, yeah. I, want to, I want to go to another point you said, because I'd like you to address this. And um, so, um, <clears throat> I think, so as you know, like I'm, I'm a, a supporter of free and competitive market economies and mm-hmm. uh as you are <laughs> and um i think they're important i think they help the poor uh, i think they create space for people to have uh religious liberty and they're important for the family um i do give a lot of talks on some of the negative cultural uh impacts of market economies there's no mm-hmm. perfect system there are trade-offs right. um and so but one of the things that kind of comes up over and over again that you brought up and I'd like you to address it is, you know, the factory worker or the truck driver who's lost his, his job. And I think, so let me, let me throw this out there and I want you to respond. So sometimes mm-hmm. I hear people who support the, the market say like, okay, you know, I mean, so yeah, people are going to lose their jobs. You know, uh, there used to be buggy whip drivers and there used to be, you know, typewriter com- makers, but now they lose their jobs. And of course there are new jobs. And, and that's, I think in the textbook is true. Right. Mm-hmm. And the funny thing is, is that even though we know that from the quote unquote from the textbook, we keep making this error like, oh, that won't happen anymore. It, it, right. every, it's every, it, it used, the argument is like, it used to happen, but not anymore. And that's been the same argument for you in about 150 years. Okay. <laughs> so, so that, but on the other side, there, there's actually a real person who mm-hmm. really lost his job. And right. sometimes like you see this in Appalachia and other places, it's not just a one person. It's maybe generational unemployment. Mm-hmm. And this creates real serious problems for real, actual living people. And sometimes I find that the kind of economic answer isn't satisfactory. It's like, well, yeah, great. But what about these people who maybe fought in the Marine Corps, mm-hmm. have a job, and then then like oh, there's a whole massive structural change um, whole industries go out of business and people are left. And let me put it this way, taking a hit for the team, right? So, okay, yeah. the, maybe the, the, the country is better off. Maybe most people are better off, but these guys are paying the price. And, you know, it doesn't do them any good to say, well, you know, don't worry about it. <laughs> Everybody else is doing better and things are cheaper at Costco and Walmart. Uh, so, you know, take a hit for the team. Like, what do you say to that? How do you deal with that? And then do we as a society owe them something? How do we think about that? And what's the best way to address it? Well, that's sort of the whole middle part of my book, Rebuilding a Culture of Virtue, is about this. Because it's one thing to say, to sort of diagnose and explain what's happening in the economy uh, in general, which I, you summarized it, and I've already articulated it, is that technological changes generally make us more productive as a society, and there's a sort of net gain in value and wealth. At the same time, it doesn't follow that individual people aren't harmed because of disruption. And that's what I think we're talking about. But then the question is, okay, so what do we do about that? Because it's one thing to say, well, I feel bad for people and that's terrible. That doesn't help them to say that. I mean, maybe it will make them feel better. What I want to know is, okay, what can people, actual people do that are willing to do something about it? And that's really, in some ways, they didn't want, the book almost ended up with a subtitle on how to, how to prepare for an age of smart machines. But that's kind of what the middle of it is about. Um, and, and you finally, ultimately the question is going to be, okay, what do individuals do? And I think, um, this is, we have a complicated mix of problems in that we have massive disruption. You, you mentioned Appalachia. I talk about a few towns, uh, in, uh, in the book, but, and I just recently did a study of Youngstown, Ohio. And if you look at some of these towns, for instance, and in fact, almost every single one of them has exactly the same problem. They were either steel towns or coal mine towns or something like that. And you have this depressed underclass that's still there. And people say, well, why don't they move? Which is actually a good question. But and the answer is usually actually all the most of the people did move already. They moved 50 years ago. A lot of these mining towns 
the people living there are pining for jobs that haven't existed for two generations. And so it's not like they disappeared yesterday. And so what you have is a lot of people did actually pick up and move. Other people didn't either. They didn't have the gumption to do it or they didn't know how to do it or, um, you know, they had sort of other problems. And now they live in towns where the best job is a job with the city or the state is so, in social services. And you have generational cycles of poverty in which people basically live as words of the state and really, really depressing lives. I don't think that's the way to fix it. I think that's the way to perpetuate it. We're basically paying people to stay poor. Um, And so I do think finally, you have to be able to provide people with some useful advice to, okay, how do you actually, if you're interested, what can I do to actually survive and and make a real transition? And I think for people that are willing to do that, uh, I think the, the, the sky is the limit. I mean, that's, it's, this is unpopular to say, but I just simply think it's true. It's really unpopular to say it, but every American in the United States of America in 2018 has vastly more options than basically every human in human history prior to the 20th century. I mean, the Irish that came to the United States mostly in the 19th century, they were completely out of options. It was basically stay here and be oppressed as tenant farmers and probably starve or get on a boat and leave everything we know and everyone we know behind to go to a country that is far off and uh, from which we'll never return. Those were the the sort of options. Okay, likely starvation or leave everything behind. For Americans, I mean, the truth of the matter is for those who are interested, we can actually learn things. You can actually learn skills and at least information more or less free at any public library on the internet. You can do this. My my children go through educational uh, series online. The problem is, is that the kids that um, really don't even need that are the ones that are accessing it, whereas the poor kids in the underclass that can most benefit from it aren't actually doing it. And so, and that's why I talk so much about virtue, because I actually think the main issue at this point, it's not an economic issue, it's, it's a cultural and a moral issue of destruction of families and culture and virtue forming institutions like churches and communities where human beings actually learn the virtue that allows them to succeed and to pursue uh, lives of happiness and purpose. And when you don't have that, it doesn't matter how much prosperity you have around you, you're not going to be able to be prepared for whatever disruption is coming because the disruption is coming. Okay, so so that's, that's, that's I want to then go to this part because it's the second part of your book. So in the first part, you set out really the problem. And you, you say, look, in one sense, I'm kind of summarizing, it's happened mm-hmm. before. But in another sense, this is different because it's super fast. And, mm-hmm. and we have to be prepared. And that I think you, you said like there was a survey and most of the people think their jobs won't, won't be replaced. But you say, That's no, right. you're wrong. Your job is most likely going to be replaced. So in one sense, you have, you're, you agree with the kind of dystopian pessimists who are like, this is going down and it's going to be bad, right? <laughs> yeah, and, I agree with the basic idea that information technology is rapidly advancing and is going to do a heck of a lot more than people think it's going to be able to do. And it's going to happen really soon. So I just totally agree with that. I just think it means something different than what both the utopians and dystopians say. And part of the way that you think it means something different is that we've talked about is that, (laughs) you know, look, every other generation that's gone through massive uh, structural change, even though it hasn't been as fast, thought the exact same thing. And of course it, 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 they've been proven incorrect that in fact mm-hmm. new jobs come. And part of this goes back to the, the, the kind of the conclusions of your book that human beings are in fact really creative and all this technology makes us more creative, not less creative. And there are going to be all these new jobs like social media manager that we haven't had before, <laughs> right? But the second, but, but, and okay, so that's the kind of like the big economic argument. But then you get into this second part, which we've already touched on a little bit is, okay, so how do you handle this? What are we going to do? And you make a couple cases. You say, we have to, we have to, um, I have to understand certain things. First of all, we have to yeah. have virtue. And, mm-hmm. and I'm, so I want you, I want to talk about that. We have to have situations, as you just alluded to, where uh, not just the upper class, but the, the poor, the underclass have an ability to have access to new kinds of education to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have to have some understanding. We have to have understanding about things, that, about what information is, why the zero sum game is false, um, what, not what non-rival uh, technology means and how mm-hmm. to think about these things. So, could, so what I'd like to do now is can we summarize a little, can you summarize a little bit? Like, so what do you think 
um, I guess, what do people need to do? And you start talking about it a little bit. And then yep. what are some of the problems? I think education is one of the problems, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, some of these myths that go along. So if you're, if someone says to you, like, I, I need advice about instead of, and we'll get to this later, instead of a universal basic income and just kind of, pre, you know, batten down the hatches and prepare to be right. miserable, I don't want you to be miserable. You've got more opportunity than you realize. Here's what you need to do. What should people do? Uh, the f- first thing that they should do is say, okay, how do you differ from any kind of machine? That's the key question. If machines are going to replace us only if either we can make machines that are exactly like us or we are just machines, but we know that we're not. We have agency. We have first person subjective experience. We have freedom. We have the capacity to do different things and to choose different things for purposes. So that means that we have the capacity to form virtue. And virtue is just essentially the outcome of an act of the will in which you do something good with your body. You act in a certain way. I'm going to play the piano every day for 30 minutes really hard and carefully. And you keep doing it over and over until it becomes a habit. And then eventually, if you keep doing this and keep pursuing it, uh, your actions work their way back into your being, back inside so that you become in a sense, more than you were before, and you've developed a virtue, so this becomes automatically part of part of your being. That is something that's unique to agents with freedom. That's a key thing that distinguishes us from machines. So my argument is that let's focus on our comparative advantage over machines and develop the kinds of virtues that correspond to the unique or the kind of particular features that make the information economy what it is. So if the information economy um, is highly disruptive, uh, if it's growing an exponential pace, and at least in the kind of information dense sectors, um, you know, if it is digital, so things are, a lot of the world of atoms is being converted to the world of bits as it is, if it's hyper connected as it is, and if it's ever more informational, which it is. Those are the five things that I say distinguish an information economy. What virtues best correspond to those features so that we essentially optimize ourselves for this kind of economy? And so the virtues I give are uh, courage. So you need courage in the context of disruption because there's going to be a lot of failure. But you also need to be able to improve from failure and from uh, making mistakes. That's the virtue of anti-fragility, where you don't just say solid and you're also not fragile. You benefit from change and from disruption. Why don't you Uh, talk about anti-fragility? So that's obviously Nassim Taleb's um, concept. and Exactly. uh, That the opposite of fragile is not robust, but the opposite is anti-fragile. Anti-fragile, yeah. That you benefit from difficulty. So I think... Exactly. I haven't seen Iron Man, but you give the... But it is kind of like, it's, it's like the suit in Black Panther. Yes, it's the suit in Black Panther or, yeah, in, in Iron <laughs> Man, you know, he gets zapped um, and it's supposed to kill him, but it actually powers him up a little bit. That's kind of the ad- idea of anti-fragility. But really, the best examples of anti-fragility are all in the biological world. I mean, we do this when we lift weights. If you lift weights properly, you go in, you lift weights really hard, and really intensely, you break down some muscle fibers, you create inflammation, and then you, if you eat properly and you rest, your body will build them a little larger and a little stronger than they were before. That's anti-fragility. So sort of think of it, rather than, uh, you know, uh, Taleb talks about this, of course, in his book, Anti-Fragile, but you've got robust, which just means it, it's sort of solid, and so it's not going to be easily broken, but like really strong ceramic, um, it doesn't get better if you pound it. It just eventually breaks. That's different from fragile. But there's really this third thing, which is anti-fragility, that's a mark both of the biological world, but it's also, I think, of agents. We are able to do this in part by the choices that we make, the, 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 what we decide to do with what we've been given. You've been given gifts. You're also going to be given difficulties. Are you going to be the kind of person that actually learns from it so you don't make the same mistake twice? Uh, or are you going to get depressed and just feel like you're unlucky and hate everybody for it? That's the, the, again, anti-fragility. It's, a, it's something that we can develop as a virtue. And I think it's, it's highly underpriced. And what's depressing about it right now is that at the very moment when we most need to be anti-fragile, when there's going to be a lot of disruptions, college students are going to try several things, usually before they find something they're good at and can succeed at. We have entire college degrees that make students fragile, that make them hypersensitive to insults. And it's exactly the opposite of what you ought to do. It's just like when you're raising your kids. You want your kids to be inoculated against bad ideas. You don't want them to be little hothouse flowers that wilt the second they go out and show up on a college campus. 
Um, it, it, and, and again, it sort of comes back to, okay, if you need this virtue, um, as an individual, as an adult, I would argue you still have the capacity to develop this if you decide you want to. But as parents with children, we have to think about, okay, what kind of environment are we pr- providing for our children so that they can also develop these virtues? Because, of course, there are always basic virtues that you need. I mean, there's still the basic pathway to success in the U.S. that if you graduate from high school, go to college or trade school, stay out of trouble, don't commit crime, wait until you're married to have kids, find something that people value and get really good at that, you're not going to be poor. You're not. You're just not going to be desperately poor. You may not be rich. That's a really kind of simple pathway to poverty, uh, out of poverty, um, but it's not an insp- especially inspiring vision. And so that's what I want to propose for people that, okay, of course, d- don't be a murderer. That's, that I'm presupposing that, but what do you really need to do to succeed and to prosper in this particular type of economy, which is different from, say, the, an industrial or an agrarian economy. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Yeah, so that's anti-fragility. So the virtues, courage, anti-fragility. What other, what other virtues do you need? Altruism. And altruism is, again, another one of these things that, um, of course, I have to challenge the, the myth that enterprise is all about selfishness and self-interest. Of course, business people are pursuing their self-interest, but great entrepreneurs in market economies succeed because they can anticipate the wants and the needs of others, sometimes better than the others. Um, Steve Jobs didn't get rich stealing iPods from homeless people. He was able to anticipate and create things that people liked and also market them in a way that attracted people. Um, and altruism is especially important, I argue, in a digital economy, because in a digital economy, we create more and more goods that are, as you mentioned a minute ago, are non-rival. A non-rival good is just a good that you can have and it doesn't prevent somebody else from having it. So a physical uh, set of the Encyclopedia Britannica is a rival good. If I have it in my house, you can't have it in your house in Grand Rapids, Michigan. On the other hand, the subscription to the online version of Encyclopedia Britannica is non-rival. I can have one, but if I if I get a subscription, that doesn't deplete the set of subscriptions. It's in principle, you know, it's an infinite number of people could have it. That's not literally true, but effectively in economic terms. It's also more or less zero, has zero marginal cost. So once the infrastructure is in place to have subscriptions to Encyclopedia Britannica, each additional subscription is basically free. So that's different. This is, this is just the nature of the digital economy is that lots and lots of goods are non-rival and approach zero marginal cost. And so this makes it different from the economy in which you're talking about gallons of oil or bushels of wheat or square feet of house. Those are rival goods. But that's really important because what that means is that there are many, many more things that people can create uh, without having to deplete some kind of physical resource. That's a good news. But what that means is that a lot of things people don't want. I mean, you can spend all day putting videos up on YouTube that are in- entertaining to you, but that you that everybody else hates. That's not going to help you economically. That's where altruism comes in. You have many opportunities to create all sorts of new goods and services that nobody had thought of before. You still have to train yourself so that you're constantly thinking, what can I do? What can I produce that people will value, that will actually meet a need? And so um, it's even more true now than maybe it was in the past that you've got to be able to focus on that question. If you were a a subsistence farmer and you had a decent and healthy enough farm that you could feed yourself, in a sense, you could be self-centered uh, because you could at least survive. Uh, that's not really the case now. There, you can, there are a lot more ways to produce things, uh, but if you don't figure out ways to produce things that people value, you're going to be in serious trouble. You know, one of the things I, I liked I liked about the book is there's a tension that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, as you, you go through all these things, you t- I mean, there's a lot of things I could go right now. I, I I, I kind of want you to talk about the problems with the educational system. So I, mm-hmm. I, I, maybe, maybe I'll do that first. Actually, let's do that first. And then I'm going to okay. go bring up this tension between um, thinking of others, l- learning and following your passion. So, but first, you know, you, you've kind of mentioned this before. And, and I think this is a really important point is um, what are some of the things that are blocking the development of, of people to, say, adapt and change to the, to this new environment. Now you, in your, in your book, you talk about mm-hmm. the first American dream, which is to own a farm. The second right. American dream is to own a house. And then we're in a third American dream. And so how do you mm-hmm. define, first of all, how do you define the third American dream? The third American dream is more amorphous, but it's essentially, so far as I can tell, the desire to create value. So if you ask 
20 uh, somethings. I live in Washington, D.C., what they want to do. And this, of course, I live around a, and it's a place where you get lots of highly ambitious people. But people don't say they don't say, well, I really want to own a home, even if they're sort of conservative Christian and they want to get married and have a family. They don't that, that, owning a home is not sort of central to them. They want to do something that is significant or that creates value. And that's a kind of you know interesting thing, I think, that's happening, because in some ways, I think that's that's a very good thing that people are thinking about that in, in those terms. I think it's kind of more spiritually elevated, but it's also a little bit less distinct than owning a home or owning a farm, which is a very concrete thing. But I do think that that is uh, more and more people. Part of it is because the reality is if you're in Washington, D.C. and you've got any kind of uh, upper middle class job, you're not worried about starvation. You're not worried about where you're going to live. It's super expensive. And maybe you will buy a condominium or a house at some point. But you're actually thinking about, OK, what can I do that's meaningful and purposeful? I would say uh, first, get out of Washington, D.C. Get out of Washington, D.C. <laughs> exactly. It makes it, it makes it very, very, <laughs> very, very difficult. You know, but I, it's funny because I, I noticed this um, and I, I constantly, you know, I, I encounter lots of people that are, say, in their 20s, or early 30s. Most of them have multiple business cards. They have a thing that pays the bills, a thing that they're really kind of into and another side gig that they hope takes off at some point. Um, it, but it's clear that they're, they're searching for meaning and for purpose. And we know from happiness studies that people that find satisfaction in their work are people who think they're doing something of value for other people. That just over and over, that's what we find. And so I think in some ways um, this is a good thing. But I think the problem is a lot of people don't sort of realize that there are lots of ways to create value for other people. Too often we think, well, if I'm not a missionary uh, or I'm not helping sort uh, you know, cure AIDS in the third world or, or something like that, I'm not doing anything that's very important. I tell this story, though, this guy, Les Swanson, that uh, Mike Rowe talked about in his, his great series, Dirty Jobs, who was a Wisconsin guy that was just looking around at what needed to be done in his city and realized that a lot of people, there was no good way to clean septic tanks. He developed a new way to clean septic tanks, got really good at it, has now has a multi-million dollar business and loves it. He loves it not because there's anything intrinsically interesting about cleaning septic tanks. Obviously, there's not. He loves it because he knows he's doing something that people need and value. He's filling a need and it provides value for him and his family as well. And so I think that kind of, in some ways, the, the clarity of this idea is a good thing. But what that means is to actually be able to create value for other people. And it, it requires the cultivation of certain virtues, like in this case, uh, altruism, in which we're actually focused on what other people need and want. So that, okay, so let, let me just push for a minute. So that, okay, I, that's very interesting. And, you know, Washington, D.C., it's so you're somewhat in a, in a maybe a different spot, right? You're right. highly educated, you know, that Charles Murray and others have talked about the, this the kind of the high, high end income uh, in mm -hmm. these specific zip codes. But what about say an average American, right? Or even somebody from a poor, a poor family underclass who's, who's struggling, mm -hmm. who's stuck in say government run public education that I think is, right. you know, dominated by unions at the expense of, of the poor. Um, and it's dominated not just by unions, but by a whole ideology, which is right. probably another another <laughs> podcast in itself. Uh, but, um, but uh, what what are what are some of the a, a, so what are some of the obstacles that they're facing, especially with education? And mm -hmm. um, what about? I mean, the fact that I think a lot of people they do need. But they want a home. They want a home, not because yeah. a home means, not because, because of what, because of what a home means, right? It means a sense, right. sense of stability. It means that you're, I mean, generally you, you're married. It gives you incentives to stay married. Not always, Absolutely. but it does. So, so talk a little bit about, um, you know, I, I guess what I'm saying is you, you, you could you listen to this and think, okay, yeah, that's great for, this is really kind of an upper middle class gig. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's actually one of the critiques. It's like everything benefits the upper middle class. But you seem to be saying in the book, this is not just for the upper middle class. This is for everybody. Absolutely. And we, have to, yeah. we have to think it about is. that. So talk, talk well, about that a little bit. Yeah, the obstacles are basically the same thing. They are culture and virtue forming institutions. And so the reason that it's unfortunate that we associate marriage and family and staying married and living and owning a house and having a job with the upper middle class as if they're just sort of relative to that. The reality is, as Murray talks about in his book, Coming Apart, is that even for more secular upper middle class people more or less live in ways that are conducive to these things, whereas the lower class is trapped in a kind of horrible concentric 
spheres, uh, one after the other of institutions that prevent these things. So public Often, schools, oftentimes, by the way, I think I would say, let me push back, yeah. uh, created, incentivized by the upper middle class, right? And, oh, and, and, yeah, is absolutely. it falsely a try to way to help them? Absolutely. Which I think hurts yeah. them. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I mean, I think, I, I think the welfare state in general, this, all of which I think was produced by people who meant well and just simply wanted to help the poor. I don't think it was designed to keep people poor, but I do think that's what it in fact more or less does. Public schools in general. So in Washington, D.C., public schools, the kids in public schools are $20,000 a year is spent on kids in public schools in Washington, D.C. And unless you're in the magnet STEM school that I live next to that's a public school, you don't want to be in most of these schools. So the problem isn't a lack of money. It's a kind of cultural devastation. About 70 percent of the kids that are in those schools are being raised by single mothers. We know that correlates with childhood poverty, with crime, with dropping out of high school, all these things. These are all cultural institutions that for a complicated set of reasons have been devastated and especially been devastated among the underclass. And so you might say, well, at a practical level, if you live in a Youngstown, Ohio, and there's no job prospects, move to Omaha, go on Google and find out where unemployment is 2% and just move there. But the reality is you have lived your entire life in this one place and you've, you've never even been taught Th that level of initiative, never even seen anybody with that level of initiative. Whereas if you live in Silicon Valley, you're around people that are doing this all the time. So there is, a, unfortunately, a Matthew effect in which uh, the Matthew effect is just that, you know, from those who much is given, much is uh, <laughs> even more will be given. And those who have little, even what they have will be taken away. That's the kind of reality is that you get these cultural dynamics in which you get virtuous cycles in one segment and you get vicious cycles in the other. And unless we can break some of those vicious cultural cycles in the cultural institutions that are keeping the underclass, the underclass, I don't think there's any way to actually solve it. And I don't think there is a simple economic uh, way of solving that. I actually think it's frankly a religious and a, and a cultural problem. And our economic policies more often than not actually make the problems worse. Well, I want, I want to move to another topic, but just quickly, what Give me two or three things that you think are at the source of this um, problem. If it's not economic, um, mm -hmm. then what are the core kind of religious and um, philosophical problems? I, I mean, I, I think certainly the core, uh, one of the core problems is the widespread use of divorce and illegitimacy uh, 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 among Americans. I mean, this used to be a very rare thing, um, and now it's quite common. And the reality is that you can sound like a sort of moral scold when you say that, but the number one predictor of childhood poverty in the United States is whether that child is raised in a home with his father in the home. And if the father is married to the mother, even better. And so the idea that we're going to sort of solve the underclass problem without dealing with um, the marriage and family problem, I think it's we're, we're, we're dreaming. And I think that everything stems from that. And I mean, I, I honestly think that, that, that what John Paul II called the culture of death uh, and this this culture of divorce and illegitimacy, I think, is more responsible for the persistent poverty we see in the United States than anything that you could talk about in technology or regulation. Mm -hmm. And these, I think, I mean, I, I would agree. I think Brad Wilcox's work at the University of Virginia yes. has shown a lot of, of this. There's a lot of other people. The data is pretty clear on this. Um, it's not very popular data no. because it goes against the kind of cultural moves. But I think, I think this also comes back to, you know, I'm jumping ahead, but I'm, this Ooh. comes back to, a certain view of what a human person is, uh, what it means to be embodied, and I think what freedom is, right? I mean, is freedom simply merely exercising your will, or does freedom have some some connection to the good? And I think yes. generally speaking, uh, and I think you, you noted this with like Charles Murray and others, that a lot of the people, even, this, even kind of secular, like very kind of ma philosophically materialist um, advocates, mm -hmm. advocates of philosophical materialism who are very secular, um, don't actually tend to live the no. way that what they preach. They actually tend to live kind of what you'd call kind of conservative, yeah. traditional ways of getting married, staying married, avoiding divorce, um, you know, certain building habits of virtue and courage and altruism, the things that you talk about, uh, they tend to preach something different. So it's, it's an mm -hmm. interesting question to me if there's, there's a sense of like, though, say, so, you know, I, I'm clearly not a philosophical materialist and, and I'm, I'm Roman Catholic and, uh, all these ideas that that I think come out of 
deep patrimony, right? They're, they're, they're first yes. of all, the, the Hebrew uh, Bible, uh, the tradition of Judaism and Christianity, but also like ancient civilizational key ideas that you talk about from Aristotle and Plato. Um, why aren't they, why aren't they very fashionable? Uh, is it, it seems like you're, like you said, like, oh, I don't want to sound like a moral scold here. No, like, you yeah, know, like not, we're almost yeah. embarrassed. Like, you know, a virtue is really important and you're not a machine. Uh, like, no, exactly. oh my goodness. Are you going to lose friends at the cocktail party oh, for saying that? Probably. Like, why? Why? Awesome. I've purged those friends long ago. I, so I don't, don't have any friends to lose. No, exactly. So They're all gone. Very but it is. I mean, as you know, from having read the book, I spend time talking about Aristotle. People think they're going to get this kind of high tech lesson. When in fact it's like, well, no, you actually need to pursue virtue. And I talk, I spent a lot of time talking about this virtue that I call creative freedom. And the reason is I wanted that term to distinguish this the freedom of indifference, this idea of freedom that freedom is just getting to do whatever you want to do. And if I can do that, I'll be happy. Well, okay, there's a sense in which, yeah, if you can choose vanilla or strawberry ice cream and without anybody forcing you which one you're going to choose, that's a type of freedom, but it's an extremely minimal type of freedom. It's kind of a necessary freedom for being able to do other stuff. Mm -hmm. The real kind of freedom that's virtuous is the freedom in which we constantly constrain ourselves in pursuit of some vision of the good. It can be a broader vision of the good, or it can be something as simple as, okay, I'm going to get really good at computer engineering. I'm going to get really good at carpentry. I'm going to get really good at playing the piano. A child that learns to play the piano really well, she is far more free as a pianist than she was before she'd ever taken her first lesson. That's a type of freedom. It's a type of freedom that the American founders understood perfectly. They were quite clear of this. But I think most Americans, when we're talking about freedom, unfortunately, we think, well, freedom is just if, if I can smoke pot, nobody bothers me and I can have sex with whomever I want, then, then I'm free. No, actually not. You're going to end up a prisoner to your passions. That's not the kind of freedom that we're talking about. And so I really just don't think, popular or not, that there's any way around um, talking about virtue and virtue forming habits and virtue forming institutions. All right. And, and again, I mean, this is, it's funny because you sound, Oh, I felt like a moral scold. Okay. But it's Aristotle, it's Plato, it's ancient Chinese civilization. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. This stuff didn't, you know, this stuff it, it lasts because it works and it means sure. something. And I think, but, but again, like what, what, I mean, so this concept of freedom, I think is, um, one of the examples I, I, I like to give um, uh, is, and so listeners will have heard this before probably, but is that, you know, you idea, this idea, the freedom is merely exercising your will. And so I say, mm. if I, if I started banging my head on the end of a table and blood spurted out, no one would see, wow, wow, wow mm. Michael is really free. No, you would think I was crazy, right? Yeah. Because as I think as Ratzinger says in one of his essays, an irrational will is not a free will. And so yeah. we have this, but it's a very interesting tension and uh, mm -hmm. between two kinds of these ideas of freedom. One is radical liberty. So it's just raw exercise of your will and freedom mm -hmm. and all the things you said. Or, and usually the funny thing is it's and. Yes. Philosophical materialism, which says that you have no free will and you're determined. So whether it's Skinner yeah. or the, you know, the, the popular Sam Harris today, yes. who makes an argument. I mean, and we've talked about this. Sam Harris makes an argument trying to convince me. He says in his argument, the truth matters. And we need yes. to be aware of the fact that we have no freedom whatsoever. And we are completely <laughs> determined. To which I say, well, why are you, A, making an argument right. to try to convince me of that? Because if you or me, Adam for Adam, you're determined to believe there's free will. And then the second thing, and I actually talked about this on another podcast with um, Dr. Pat Lee, yes. is, is that the argument relies upon a, the content of the premises. And this is Pat Lee brought yeah. this up. It's like, you're making, you're making a, a, a non-material argument based on the content of the premises. That's trying to convince me to change my mind. No, so that's right. Yeah. This is, I mean, this is what an argument is, is it's propositions in which you're saying one proposition follows or entails another proposition. Logical relations are not atoms and molecules. I mean, the second you start making an argument, the second a person starts making an argument to try to persuade another person using arguments, they're already out of the realm of materialist philosophy. They already have have escaped the kind of narrow confines of the philosophy that they're trying to persuade you of. And so much of that, as I get to in the conclusion of the book, is alive and well in this debate over technology and artificial intelligence, just really bad materialist philosophy that nobody seems to be willing to reflect on. 
Well, let's talk about that. I mean, okay, I'm going to talk about that, but I am going to do one more thing since this is a podcast and it's my podcast. Uh, I'm going to ask you, <laughs> I'm going to ask you to go, I, but I want to go back to that because I think it's really, really important. And that's, what, but let me just say, there's one thing I want you to talk about that I really like. Okay. And, and so you, you, you kind of give this, 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 um, in the what to do section, you, you mm-hmm. talk about a couple of things. You say, first of all, we need to learn things. And we've mentioned this before. You need to, you need to use all of the new, the, all of these Things like Udemy or, and mm-hmm. uh, and uh, like Khan Academy, and you mentioned all yeah. these like uh, uh, Coursera and, and yeah. all these things, so you can learn new things. And that's the first. Yes. And and you you bring out a point that I, I really like. You talked about I forget who the book about uh, the mi- mindset. I think and this idea. Yes. Of, who wrote that? Oh, um, D- uh, Dweck, Carol Dweck. Carol Dweck. Okay. About and and it's like a you have this whether you have a fixed. What, what's the term? It's either a fixed or a growth mindset. So a fixed mindset right, is right. just that you're sort of born with it and you can't do anything about it. But if you're if you're good at math, you're a math genius and you don't need to do anything about it. And if you have a growth mindset, you say, well, I can get good at math, but I'm going to have to work really hard at it. And Dweck spent 20 years studying different people and doing longitudinal studies about the way what, – what are the outcomes of people that tend to have growth or fixed mindsets? And what she found is that – it's really kind of it's bad to have a fixed mindset because right. if you think okay if you have a fixed mindset you don't want to study for math tests because that would mean that you're not a math genius um, and so you end up either unless you just happen to be innately really good at something and don't have to practice you can end up frankly it's kind of a failure not sort of uh, uh, fulfilling what you, your actual potential if you have a growth mindset if you fail it's like gosh I guess I needed to try harder I needed to study harder what do I need to do to improve that. Um, and so basically growth mindsets correlate with success and happiness, whereas fixed mindsets don't. That's the bad news. The good news is that you can actually develop a fixed mindset right. because we are in fact free agents who have, and we're not fixed. We're not fixed. You can actually do this. We know this now. And we've always known this since the time of Aristotle, but we actually now know it from brain studies in this whole list. Well, Jeffrey Schwartz's here. stuff. We yes. talked about Jeffrey Schwartz did this study on, on obsessive compulsive disorder and yes. through, and this is very unnuanced, simple, but through meditation and through concentration, mm-hmm. encouraged his patients to try to control some of their obsessive compulsive behaviors. That's right. And these are very hard because there's, there are neurons firing that yes. are creating the obsession and neurons fine, creating the, comp- uh, com- you know, the compulsion to do it. And through mm-hmm. meditation, they, they were able to somewhat overcome it. And it in fact changed the neurological structure. So that's actually, there's neuroplasticity. The brain changes through acts of the will. Yeah. Right. Which of course is in St. Thomas Aquinas and it's not it brand is. new. No, but, it's not. But, but we didn't have, have brain now. scans. Yeah. We didn't know this, it, you know, and, that, and now we actually, we, we know it at the neurophysiological level. And I think that's, that's just really, really important because if that weren't true, then if you say, well, this poor, this child was raised in a single home in a poor part of poor neighborhood in which crime was rife then, oh, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing you can tell him because he's just right. trapped forever. That's what that would mean. But in fact, that's not true. It means that he started out, the baseline was way below where a lot of other kids started, but he's still a human being made in the image of God. He still has uh, the capacity to exercise virtue and to develop it. And that's the thing I choose to focus on. It doesn't help a child to say, oh, you're so unfortunate and you've been right. oppressed. And uh, how does that help him? It doesn't do anything for I- anyone to be told that. They need to be told that, in fact, there's something that they can do to improve their situation and what exactly is it that they should do. Right. I mean, it's, it's fine to acknowledge it. Okay. Yes. Life is hard. Like, you know, you, you, you may not be as naturally good at this as somebody else. Like, so one of my children, uh, one of my daughters, she always says like, I'm not very good at math. And so they all have to play the violin. It's one of their rules. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. they have to play the violin and, and so they have to finish <laughs> Suzuki book four. That's their, okay. That's the lock double. And that's what they have to do. And I was like, I, I'm not, I'm not a very good violinist. And I, and I, I'm so like, I said, well, actually you're not even, you're not even a bad violinist yet. <laughs> <laughs> You're just learning, right? And but I, I like that. There's a guy called you know who Josh Waitkin is. Is that name familiar? No. Okay, so no. Josh, you might even know him because he, there's this movie called Searching for Bobby Fisher. You ever seen that? Oh, movie? sure. Yes, okay, I have about the chess prodigy. Okay, so yeah. so this guy, um, it, it turns out he he um, decided that he was going to go learn to do push hands, which is like a, a a combative form of tai chi. It's a martial form of tai chi, and he okay. became like a, a world champion or something. And uh, so he's still, after being a, like this great chess player, he now becomes a great Tai Chi martial arts practitioner. And um, he wrote a book, and I think it's called The Art of Learning, which I like very much. It goes back to the mm-hmm. mindset. And um, he kind of, I, I, may, I, have, I read it many years ago, but he, 
this is the the idea that he that there's two kinds of attitudes, right? One mm-hmm. is that you have this identity and that's who you are. So he would find all these chess players and some of them were like, they were good chess players and they defined themselves as being good chess players. And so they would never push themselves because if they lost a match, it would destroy their identity. And so here's like, like a, you know, maybe a 10 year old kid coming to play one of the best chess players in the world. And they wouldn't even play him because mm. it would, it would like, Oh wait, I, I can't lose. He said, and yeah. there's the other who had this idea of kind of what he called, I think it's called incremental learning yeah. and that you're just constantly saying, okay, I'm not, I, I'm not, uh, I didn't do that so well, but I can, I can improve. I can learn. And I think that what's happened is, um, and this goes to your, the second part of your book, there's a sense of, you know, where it's either you're, you, some people have more skills than other people or natural mm-hmm. abilities. Some of people course. have a better, like if you grow up in a, in a intact household with married mother and father who love one another and a number of brothers and sisters, and you get to, you know, go to a very good school, you have a better start than someone yes. who's from a broken uh, family and, and, and a very poor school. But so it's okay to acknowledge it, Right. You, some people have more athletic capacity than other people, but, Definitely. but once you get into that sense of like, there's no such thing as incremental learning and this is who you are, mm. um, it is very destructive and it's especially destructive for the people who need it most. Absolutely. And, That's exactly the point. And, and I find it to be a deeply condescending type of social engineering that says to people, well, you're just stuck where you are and it's yeah. my duty to help you. Whether That's it's right. through charity or foreign aid, and you know I've done work on the, yes. on the critiques of that, right. and or through the universal basic income, which all kind of like deny this creative capacity of the human being. It and, does, and, and takes away their basic dignity because I think the intention is okay. Well, you can't help yourself. There's nothing you can do, so let me help you. And then it turns out in in the act of me helping you, I make you dependent. So you're even less able to actually help yourself. This is not the way. That's not the right kind of help. The kind of help we should give people is the kind of help that allows them uh, to succeed. Uh, and this this unfortunately too often, um, as I talk about in one of the last chapters of the book, is not what we've done, certainly with economic and social policy. We've in fact just created cycles of dependency. Right. So you have this tension. So the last thing, before I go to the materialism and the person which I want to end, I just want to have this other tension. So you have these, all these tensions. One, bad stuff's happening. You better be prepared. Good. You can be prepared. Yeah. Uh, um, pessimism. There's a dark side of technology. Mm-hmm. Um, it can really, like the you know, Nicholas Carr in the shallows, it can really have negative effects on us. It can uh, create distraction. It can create narcissism, unhappiness, depression, but there's also some positive things that can come from it, right? Um, you, you can learn, you can do things, but don't just follow your passion because that's mm. bad advice. Yeah. Why is following your passion <laughs> Bad advice. It's it should be obvious that we, we don't tell our kids just do whatever feels good, honey, and you'll be happy. We would never think to tell them that, but then when they graduate from high school, we tell them follow their passion, and then they'll succeed. Um, I think it gets things backwards. Now, I'm not saying you should do something you hate and stick with that the rest of your life. What I'm saying is that it, it, we're talking about sort of advice that you would give to high school graduates or to college graduates, your passion is fleeting. You might like something today and you're bored with it tomorrow. Or maybe you're not really passionate about anything in particular. Or maybe you're passionate about playing World of Warcraft 15 hours a day in your pajamas. There's no reason to think that your passion is going to be this kind of magical uh, map that's going to take you to a destination where you're creating value for other people. I think it's much wiser advice to say, okay, find out what you could be good at that other people value, focus on that. Focus on creating and doing things that other people value. Um, and the passion will follow because that's what one way you get passionate about something is by doing something uh, that's a value to other people. And so I'm not saying uh, sort of put, don't do anything that you're passionate about. I'm just saying that by itself, the thing you happen to be passionate about For me, at one point, it was being a rock musician. Or another time, it was being an oceanographer. Even though I lived 13 hours from the nearest ocean, never seen the ocean, Um, these weren't all that good. They would not have been good guides for me uh, to figure out what it was I was supposed to do. In my own career, it's been more a matter of okay, well, here's something I think I could do. I'm interested in, and maybe I can create value here and test it out and pray about it. But my, my sense is that look, rather than telling people, especially kids and teenagers, to follow their passion. Tell them to discover their calling. Tell them, okay, seek out, prepare yourself, make yourself adaptable, become literate and numerate, 
and, and courteous and punctual and do these things that you need and then be prayerful and open and find ways to create value for people and then focus on one of those things. And you might have to try two or three different things before you end up, you know, sort of pursuing the path uh, that will give you both economic success and, and, and this worldly happiness. That just seems much wiser to me than to tell 100 million, you know, uh, teenagers and, and 20 year olds that uh, they should just, well, whatever, whatever your dreams are, follow your bliss. That just, this just seems like really stupid advice to me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, so give me the, give me the summary, give me the summary of the book. All right. This is a, it's a book about real coming technological change. We're already seeing it. It's very mm -hmm. clear. Um, you, you know, it's on the headlines every day, um, of robots and artificial intelligence. And a lot of people are worried. And you share the worry, but unlike most of the books, which tend to be pessimistic, you say there's, 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 um, cause for, um, uh, maybe not optimism, but there's cause for hope. And, yeah. and, and, uh, and this creates an opportunity for it to exercise, um, virtue and what uniquely makes us human. So why don't you summarize the book? Like, what is the key takeaway that you want people to get from this book? That was actually it, Michael, but let, let me put it in my own terms is that, uh, on the one hand, we're, we're coming up on an age of massive disruption in which machines are going to do many of the things that we thought only humans could do. That's going to create disruption where a lot of us have to readjust. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is that we shouldn't panic. We should prepare because we're going to also entering into a type of economy which is uniquely fit for human beings because human beings, human agents are the sole sources of new information, the kind of robust information that we're interested in. An information economy is ultimately uniquely fit for human beings as long as we can adapt to that. That means that we're not going to be completely out of work. We're not going to cease to do things of value. We're not going to cease to create value. We can find new ways to create value, but we do have to adapt for it. Great. All right. So the book is The Human Advantage, The Future of American Work in the Age of Smart Machines by Jay Richards. Uh, you can find the book at Amazon. You can find it on Kindle. I read it on Kindle until my charger went out and I was missing the real, the, what I call the real book, uh, but I, I don't want to get a lecture from Jay on that. So, uh, so you can find it there and I encourage you to look, at, look up Jay at Catholic University of America and also uh, his news service called mm -hmm. The Stream. Again, the book is The Human Advantage. Jay, thanks again for, for being on the show. Great to be with you, Michael. 